tokenization turns all of your uh, audience, customers, prospects into influencers who are vested in your company. That's why you can see this like hyper success that, that's happening with some projects that take off uh, in Web3. The point is you can see this hyper growth because there's that network effect where literally every one of your customers is now like a shareholder in some ways, right? Everyone has stock options on the success of your product, of your business. And so it's not just the influencers you work with, it's everyone becomes an influencer or a micro-influencer by default, right? And that's powerful. Hello and welcome to the D2C Podcast. I'm Eric Dick, and today we have something a little different for you. Um, we've got a friend named Chris Rempel. He operates as the Lazy Marketer at thelazymarketer.com, and he's long been uh, a lifestyle marketing uh, personality, essentially. And, and he's just been able to watch all of the trends that have happened in the digital marketing world since, I think, even before Google, he was saying, around you know 2004, 2005, he was already involved in digital marketing. And he's produced a great report on the opportunities available in Web3. And that's what this podcast is all about. We're going to discuss NFTs. We're going to discuss the metaverse. We're going to discuss all of the different ways that uh, Web3 is going to change the world and, and change the world for D2C brand builders and D2C marketers. So uh, I hope you enjoy this. It's, it's something a little bit different. You'll find actually the PDF from Chris is available in the show's notes. You can just download it. Uh, and it's a really great sort of history of, of web, web 1, Web 2, and, and what Web 3 really means. So I hope you enjoy this. On with the show. This podcast is sponsored by Klaviyo, the email and text marketing platform that puts D2C brands in control. If you're the leader of a D2C brand, you need a platform that hustles as hard as you do. Klaviyo unlocks the power of your e-commerce data so you can personalize and automate messages that keep customers coming back. D2C brands communicate with Klaviyo. Get started for free at klaviyo.com slash DTC. Welcome to the D2C podcast, Chris. Let's just start with what is Web3? Great question. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, I think the easiest way to describe it is Web3 gives you a chance to own pieces of the internet. Uh, and so if we were to sort of to, to go back to a very abbreviated historical background on the internet, let's call Web 1.0 is the information age, right? It's, it's, it's digital magazines, right? Here's a website. It's got images and text. Consume it. Web 2.0 is... Uh, kind of the age of websites or the age of conversation. So websites go from being digital magazines to being software, right? And so now websites are social networks, social networks, commenting on a blog, all that kind of stuff. Right. And then web 3.0, the, the direction that it takes it is it lets the user own part of the experience that they are interacting with. They, it lets communities become uh, rather, you know, communities now are, are voluntary. Like we, we all agree somehow to go to Facebook and then let them sell our data in exchange for dopamine. Uh, Web3 flips that around where we get paid to engage with a certain service or app or game or whatever. Uh, and so through tokenization, which is kind of the new native uh, structure of the Web3 internet uh, versus websites in Web 1.0 and 2.0, uh, tokenization changes the model on its head. And it lets you do a number of things that we'll, that we'll get into. But I think fundamentally, at its core, it lets users own the stuff that they're using. That's really interesting. And, and okay, let's, let's just talk about it as well. Users owning... Uh, their their data users owning a part of the transaction is that inherently is going to be on a decentralized system or is that something that can also be achieved through like you know the way I understand Web three is that you have a, you would have a token or that would go across Facebook it would go across different yeah. kind of social platforms there wouldn't be this idea of walled gardens as much with, with so I'm trying to get to like does it does it necessitate decentralization for these tokens to work in the way you describe. 
I, I think it can be both. And, you know, even in uh, the nascent Web3 space that we have right now with, say, Ethereum and Solana and these other blockchains, there's already kind of interoperability between those. Um, and, the, and those offer different levels of centralization and decentralization already, right? So, you know, Ethereum is classically decentralized, like you can't call the Ethereum support team, right? Uh, it's, it's distributed where Solana has yeah. more, more of a team behind it, that kind of thing. When we think about how people use Web3, uh, let's say six, 12, 18 months from now and how it can interact with the conventional web. So let's, let, you know, we're on a DTC podcast. Let's talk about DTC as an example. Let's say that someone in an experience buys a digital item that is in partnership with or is, is uh, part of a brand that uh, sells conventional DDC stuff, right? So let's let's just say it's um, Nike, right? Nike. So let's say let's say you're in an experience, and Nike, by the way, has been pushing into NFTs and stuff pretty hard recently. Yeah. Um, and so let's say you're in an experience and you buy some sort of digital thing that that Nike has created, uh, and then one of the benefits that, that their token or that their NFT offers you is you can go over to nike.com, which is a web two website, web two, uh, you know, e-commerce store or whatever, and connect your wallet uh, to their shopping cart system. And then all of, you know, your NFT ownership gives you the ability to unlock whatever it is, right? Maybe it's a, maybe it's a unique pair of shoes that uh, that NFT is associated with. Maybe it's some other thing, you know, maybe it's a something membership. in the metaverse. Right. And so, and, and what we mean by the metaverse, you know, <laughs> despite Mark Zuckerberg's creepy keynote the other day, uh, it's, it's not 3D Facebook. Um, at least I don't see it that way. The metaverse is the ability to have a persistent avatar uh, ID, uh, you know, a persistent identity that it connects to all of the stuff you've done, all the things you own, all the things you're entitled to, whatever, as you traverse uh, the Web3 internet. So that's websites, apps, games, whatever, even VR stuff, whatever. Uh, that is what I think the real metaverse refers to. So going back to the Nike example, right? The, the difference now uh, with tokenization is that the stuff that you would conventionally just buy, you know, in Web 2.0, or the stuff that you would, you would conventionally own, kind of stops, you know, at the moment, it shows up in your doorstep, you unbox your shoes, you put them on, there you go. Congratulations on the new shoes. In this, uh, in this new world of Web 3, that membership that maybe came along with your shoes is meaningful. It means that when you go and do any number of things that Nike has partnered with, or any other uh, experiences that even Nike, even if their hand isn't in it, uh, someone else could have created an app or website that rewards Nike owners, for instance, as maybe a marketing move or like a loyalty program or whatever. Essentially, all these options become available. It, it just means that the things that you do throughout your day uh, in respect to what you're doing online, those things now become part of a permanent record. And there's a number of options and a number of opportunities that come available as as a result of that. So for D2C owners out there thinking about, like you say, the next 12 to 18 months as these things emerge, mm -hmm. they should be trying to think of, you know, potentially add-ons to their to their communities, add-ons to their products that could potentially exist in this digital space as well. I think where my head goes and kind of what, what got me excited about this in the first place, um, you know, as I was kind of just going down the rabbit hole of, of crypto stuff and decentralization, as I think most people are right now, um, what stood out to me was that, you know, these virtual worlds that are that are that are popping up. And, uh, for example, a lot of games are becoming decentralized now and that kind of thing. Um, what 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 resonated with me is if there is something that goes to the scale of, say, Fortnite, or Roblox. Is or it a decentralized game? It is a decentralized game, right? Because there's one central, there's one arena, and then everyone enters it in with their own avatar that's persistent across the whole universe. 
Yeah, well, it's I don't I don't know if it, I would say it's decentralized. It's, no, it's, it's not a, actually. No, it's a metaverse, like as far as how that that functions. But uh, decentralization would mean that there would be something that players could physically own, or not physically, digitally, but truly own uh, in that ecosystem. Right. And so if we think about uh, actually there's a game called the sandbox that is decentralized and it's basically Roblox uh, on the blockchain. And in this case, you can buy virtual land in the game. You can buy virtual assets uh, that you truly own. But where my head goes again as a marketer and, and, and as someone interested in, in how this matters to DTC brands and other brands, let's say sandbox goes to anywhere close to the scale of Minecraft or Fortnite, or, uh, you know, Roblox, anything else. You're talking about now um, a platform that you own a piece of and where your assets are meaningful and have a, a visible impact on the game for like hundreds of millions of people, right? And so we're talking about being a formative owner and, a, and participant and creator in an ecosystem that's the size of nation states, right? And so now all of a sudden, it's not so ridiculous to think about having a digital twin for some of your products or for having like a membership that's attached to your DTC brand that gives people real benefits and real value in the virtual world, whether it's games, whether it's the decentralized metaverse in general, right? For stuff to have actual meaning and value that extends out from your physical brand, this is a big deal. It's a marketing channel and it's, an, it's a revenue expansion uh, framework. And a lot of players, uh, a lot of players, a lot of, a lot of this will be done through partnerships, I imagine, with yep. people, as you say, with games that already have, like, so for brands saying, oh, I don't want to have to, you know, create my own metaverse, you know, if you're a, a, a laundry detergent company, you're not creating your own metaverse, <laughs> but you are looking for opportunities to become present in people's, you know, uh, in, in people's experience. And because you're in a world in a matrix like world where all sorts of things are possible, mm -hmm. it probably opens up all sorts of interesting ideas for, for, for product placements, infinite ad space when you think about it. Well, that's, that's exactly it. It's interactive ads. So a good example of companies that have done this really well in the past, and this is in centralized metaverses, uh, look at Lego. Look at how Lego has, in addition to hurting my feet at 2 a.m. every freaking night, because uh, <laughs> I have toddlers, uh, yep. in addition to that, they have created an ecosystem uh, where they've become a media brand uh, outside of, as an extension and as a marketing channel to their core product line. So I was playing Forza Ford the other day, and part of the map in the UK or whatever is like Legoland. And then you go to that experience and then all of a sudden your cars turn into Lego and it's actually super fun and, and enjoyable and whatever. And it doesn't disrupt the, it doesn't, it doesn't break the fourth wall. It does it does, it's not, it doesn't feel like an ad at all. It's super fun. Uh, it's a really enjoyable part of the game and it reaches, you know, obviously kids who play with Lego aren't playing four as a four for the most part, it's the parents, right? So they're thinking about, the value chain and, and the customer journey you know, across their whole uh, marketing strategy, right? And so they're they're extending uh, this through worlds already, and that's that's an example. Um, in the, in a decentralized format, what you could do is you could buy sections of the sandbox, for instance, and let's say you're a tire company, let's say you're Pirelli or Michelin or whatever, you could make. Uh, you know, a little ring track or whatever, the people could go race their cars. There's actual prizes that they win with in-game currency, uh, which is a token that on the Ethereum main net. Um, but in order for players to have like the best experience of the fastest cars, they have to upgrade their tires, right? So if you buy a real set of, or if you buy like a, an in-game set of Pirellis, for instance, for your, for your game car, well, that real world value uh, or that, that real value could be transferable to your Pirelli account uh, when you go, you know, wherever, to your tire shop. You have a credit now from Pirelli to put those tires on your car, right? And so this yeah. is where the, the, the real and the virtual start to bridge, and the blockchain is what makes this possible. 
let's back up a little bit. This is really this is super interesting. I, so this is all a lot of this is uh, is from uh, a, a PDF which which you're which you're circulating, which I think we can link on this uh, on this podcast episode. Uh, for people that want to check it out. And one of the ideas that I thought was really interesting was when you talked about the dot-com crash, when you were talking about, I guess, web, I guess web 1.0 was the dot-com crash or was that sort of between yeah. one? Yeah. Same era sort of thing. But you had said that what was built after web, web 2.0, that, you know, the rise of the social networks was sort of built on the shoulders of what had failed in, in web mm-hmm. what 1.0. And, and I'm wondering, like when we say, okay, we're talking 12 to 18 months, you know, this is when people might be thinking about this. How much of that legwork has been done already in web 3.0 now? Are we, do we have the infrastructure needed to, to, to make this thing take off? I think, you know, we're dealing with such a, uh, uh, the, the scale of the internet today uh, is so much more, uh, well, it's so much bigger for one, but it, it's just so much more embedded um, and at such a different scale than it was back in, say, 1998, 1999, leading up to the crash, right? You know, the internet used to be something that you did on like a Wednesday afternoon, right? I'm going to go yeah. turn on the internet. Right. Yeah. And, and like that was the stage. And then like your mom picks up the phone and the connection breaks. It's like, mom, you know, anyway, that was the old experience. Now, kind of what happened with that crash, like you're saying, uh, there was there was so much hype around. I think initially it was Netscape Navigator that went public and, and that really just set the whole thing off. All of a sudden, Wall Street, you know, their eyes are popping and they're like, oh, my God, this is this is the next big thing. Everyone jumped into it and the investment dollars piled in. Uh, and they built through creative destruction and through just kind of like throwing money at it. Um, they built the real infrastructure that was actually needed for these ideas to come to fruition that physically were not possible while it was in the middle of that mania. Like if we think about and, web- and pets.com is a great example of someone that like was the idea was there. It was a great idea. And the, but yep. it just was was too early for people to adopt it. Right. You know, like e- e-commerce back then was clunky. And, and like, how do you, sh- there was no last mile shipping. There was no warehouse, warehousing of any meaningful scale. Um, people didn't trust payment processors yet. It was, it was, just, it was very, very clunky. You know, another one is like web van and, and we, you know, everyone laughed at it back then. Well, look at Instacart today. It's the same business, right? Yeah. Um, I forget what Netflix's original ancestor was, but they had a similar kind of thing. DVD rentals where they mail it to you, you know, uh, what a bunch of idiots. Well, not really, you know, it was just too early, right? Mm-hmm. So you're right. There's going to be wave, a few waves of creative destruction, I think, um, as we go through this and as we figure this out. I'm, I'm not as worried about the infrastructure um, or scaling issues. I think Web 2.0 has kind of figured out how to do that. I think it's more about trying to figure out, you know, we're dealing with new physics of how business models can work and of how micro economies can can work. And so I think it's going to be more the human aspect of figuring out what game theory can outlive its initial sort of hype. Um, you know, what what new models are going to be lasting and durable? Um, and I think that's what's going to arise. So it's I'm not as concerned about like, you know, how do we get X number of users into a thing? I, I think we've already largely solved all that stuff. It's more you know, what has the staying power? What, what beyond just the financialization of assets is going to have people stick around and care about stuff? What, let's dive back a little bit there to the, to the physics of this new economy in a way. Mm-hmm. What is fundamentally shifting? You mentioned, uh, you know, micro, you know, you know, uh, micro something in economies, microeconomics. And, and that's basically, you know, right now we don't have a great model for content, right? Mm-hmm. You know, where we're, we're paying, like, I'm not going to pay $30 for a movie right now. Just like, like $30 on my, on, you know, my, my video on demand. I'm just not going to do that. That's the, that, yeah. that economy doesn't work for me. But at the same time, so much content goes unrewarded uh, for creators. What, what do you mean when you, when you talk about this, this new economy, the new physics of the economy? Well, I think, you, you touch on it there as a, a great example is music, actually. You know, you, when you go to Spotify and you look at, is it Spotify? Yeah, it's Spotify. Um, you know, I've, I've been talking about Shopify so long, I, I miss those up. But you go to their, like, I think it's their main page, and they, they, they break down, like, here's how many creators are earning above whatever, 50,000 a year or something. And it's some tiny number, Right. And, and you look at, you know, the disparity between people and, and like there's millions of musicians on there and they're all predominantly just awesome. 
but so few are earning anything that matters in any meaningful amount. And, you know, again, it's the, that's the centralization black hole, like the, the, the network wins and they, they crank up uh, their user value. And it's just, it's just rent extraction at, at, at like maximum efficiency. Right. And so, you know, this, the, the decentralized version of that and kind of where this new set of physics comes in, um, there's music networks that are launching right now in, in, in decentralized uh, formats where th- uh, let's say an artist comes out with a new album. Uh, this is, this is kind of how it's changed. Um, they'll sell their album or they'll sell their each song as an NFT and they can, they can do a number of things. They can have it so that um, each time they sell a song or each time they sell whatever um, there's on the first time they get the full value. The musician does. And then on the secondary sales, they can get a recurring royalty. Let's say it's 5%, 10%, whatever it is. So that as their uh, customers and as their uh, fans, whatever, are reselling that NFT to other people, um, which you can do on a scarcity basis, right? Like you you can't just, with an NFT, which comes with other benefits, it's not something you can just right click save as. Right. So anyway, as those things get transferred around and resold, the artist keeps on benefiting. Now, here's the other thing you can do. Let's say that they want to reward the early fan base. Let's say they want to reward their first thousand customers or their first thousand fans. Um, well, now with the way that NFTs work, uh, those first thousand fans might have also a five percent or a ten percent royalty on the artist that they're supporting. Right. And so now as this artist becomes the next Justin Bieber or even if just, they just become moderately successful and well known or whatever, uh, you're rewarding multiple levels of the people that are responsible for your success. So it's like you're rewarding the, the true value chain and not just like the record labels and Spotify. Right. And this is perfectly applicable to D2C founders potentially as well. It's like it has me thinking about Kickstarter. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, where, where you've got people, but Kickstarter, where you can legally, you know, have value, not just a, a, a sweatshirt and a, and a mug, essentially, but mm-hmm. that you can actually, you know, invest in, in things that you believe in um, and, and benefit financially as a DTC. Deed- and there are actually, I know that there are some people doing this in the centralized fiat world, essentially. There are some platforms that, that you can, you know, when you buy enough for a product, you, you can actually get equity in that company. But I think it's a really interesting... Uh, Interesting. I wanted to talk a little bit about payments as well. What, what does what does Web three mean in the world of payments? There's a few different things. I think most obviously it's permissionless, right? And so you know, before uh, we were talking on on the podcast, we we're talking about PayPal and and you know some of the challenges that uh, you know on the marketing side and and on the creator side, the merchant side, I guess. Um, you know, PayPal and others aren't as benign an experience that consumers get to experience, right? True. You know, you're, you're as one a vendor. And that's not even counting all the minutia of the weird things that go on in an, in a transaction, like the amount of trust that has to be held. And as, like, the, it, there's a lot that goes on in what we consider a simple e-commerce transaction right now. Mm-hmm. And I imagine in Web3, that's reduced to, to, to something that's as simple as digitally handing someone some cash. It, exactly. It's and that's that's essentially what's happening is you are literally buying this from someone with dollar bills, you know, at a at a Tim Hortons or whatever, and then you hand them the item, and, and all the blockchain does is turn that into a digital ledger, right? And and so the the advantage here is for merchants that uh, you know maybe they're selling stuff like e-cigarettes or whatever that are more challenging to sell on, on conventional uh, 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 payment gateways and, and merchant accounts, um, blockchain is going to open that up. Now, obviously, there's some big caveats with that, and, and there's some pluses and minuses to society for sure. But that, that comes up most obviously. I think the other one, though, to me is like, um, I, I really think uh, in some ways uh, attaching digital it's called digital twins, but you know, when you're selling your, your products as a DDC brand and 
when someone orders whatever it is and they're also issued an NFT, I think with payments, what becomes really interesting here is you can immediately uh, redeem value from that right after your purchase. You're not waiting for it to arrive. The other part of it, though, is it'll increase the resale value of pretty much everything that has an NFT attached to it, right, or, or paired with it. Because now when you go to resell it, that membership and those perks and whatever else that come with it are actually transferred to the new owner, right? And so uh, that's, I guess that's not really about payments, but it is about the transaction ecosystem of this stuff where you know, you're gonna find that when someone buys a dress or when someone buys shoes or whatever, it, it won't drop by 90% when they go and sell it on Facebook Marketplace anymore. It's going to have uh, a different level of, of durability in its pricing. And it'll be a record of its purchase. It'll be a receipt. It'll be, mm -hmm. you know, all, all, and, and then it'll, yeah, also whatever the vendor is able to build into it in terms of its its digital experience. Very totally. interesting. NFTs are obviously something that are, you know, uh, you know, on everyone's social feed right now. I don't know how many of our listeners are, are actively involved in them. What are, what are you doing in the, uh, are you doing anything in the NFT space? Yeah, I mean, uh, other than just sort of playing around with it, Really, where I go to is gaming, because uh, I, I, gaming is the first, um, it's the first environment or ecosystem where you can have a meaningful economy right away, right? Where, in, you know, Web3 and the blockchain, it's going to take a while to sort of make its way into physical industries, where with gaming, you can start to see the use cases almost immediately with, with NFTs. So what I've been doing is I've been buying land in some of the more promising uh, metaverse projects, and that land is an NFT. And so that enables a number of different things, but the main thing is just ownership, where in time, if I want to rent out that land or do partnerships with game developers that want to build on the game or whatever, uh, I have that option. Um, so really interesting. Yeah, that, like, that's, that's how I've been thinking about NFTs. Well, how would you think about it as as DTC, uh, as a, as a media company? We've got you know uh, this this very I would say high value uh, audience of, of of people who are really deeply involved in this in this DTC space. We have people who who read our content avidly. I, could it be something as simple as creating a DTC NFT that created a you know a new portion of membership in our readership essentially? Yeah, so I've been thinking about doing this for the lazy marketer actually, and that is having kind of like an uh, like an upper VIP tier, kind of like the lifetime pass that gets people all my stuff, you know, indefinitely as long as they hold the NFT. And I've been thinking about that because if you have like let's call it a founder's pass or something like that, um, then if they buy it early on, and you you're uh, let, let's for sake of simple uh, uh, economics, let's say you've got ten courses that people get access to when they buy the Founders Pass, right, early on. Um, let's say you're, you're adding a course um, every month so that in five years' time, all of a sudden, the value of that Founders Pass is actually worth a lot more than that, than that founder paid for it. So you could conceivably mm -hmm. have a situation where they, five years down the road, could, could resell their Founders Pass NFT, and maybe they bought it for 500 bucks. It might be worth 20000 by the time they go to resell it. So they have actually made a profit and had a profitable outcome from supporting DTC or supporting the lazy marketer uh, for all those years, right? And, and in, in, the mean, in the meantime, that NFT would have value. It'd be like basically a ticketing system where it's like, you know, our VIP event that we're gonna hold in Hawaii or whatever, NFT holders can, you know, can access this and just, just fly down and join us, whatever. Right. You can you can build a whole uh, community aspect around it. You can build other sort of value propositions that are tied to it. And so that's what's interesting about it to me. I, I think like that, that's going to have a lot more staying power and actually pricing power uh, than just uh, access to a course or access to a membership. And ultimately, this all comes down to data. The amount of data that's created in these transactions. This is. I have a fundamental question that maybe you can answer. I don't know if this is the podcast for it, but there's. It seems like there's this oxymoron with the idea of the blockchain, where people who don't know it very well will say, 
it's too dangerous because it's fully anonymous. It's totally anonymized. And then people will say in the same breath that its benefit is because it's fully anonymous or that it's, that it's not anonymous and that everything is recorded on, on a blockchain. And I'm curious, how do you, from a philosophical level, is it uh, something that is totally, uh, you know, where every data, is, every data piece is there in it for eternity? Or is it something that's totally anonymous? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for such a softball uh, pitch. Yeah. Very easy to answer this one. <laughs> uh, I, I think people are going to have different avatars in a sense that I think even already, like, just from the stuff that I've been buying and investing in and whatever, I have multiple wallets. Like, uh, you know, I have my kind of hot wallet or main wallet for just sort of daily in and out stuff. Um, but let's say I buy some NFTs, whatever, that I think are, are more valuable. I'll put them on a, on a separate wallet uh, that's, that's maybe hardware locked or whatever. And, you know, in that sense, you're allowed to have different identities as you, as you interact with anything on the blockchain or the metaverse. And so you're going to have your, but the public. transaction is there, but it's not tied to you personally. That's the thing, right? So, so yes, yeah, someone could see that, that you bought, uh, some questionable items or whatever at some point, uh, but they don't know who that is until it's connected with, uh, with, a, with a real identity. Right. And so a lot of people have their like public wallets. And I see this already in crypto where, you know, some influencer will have like, you know, follow, follow my wallet to see what I'm doing kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, which is, which is kind of bizarre. It's kind of like, here's my bank account. Go check out what I'm buying. Um, yeah. And so crypto founders do that. I've seen TikToks on here's, here's the, what the wallet of this big crypto founder did this month or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. So there's a whole ecosystem around that, but you know, I, in a sense, it like, I hear, I hear what you're saying. I, I, I do think there's some danger in this over transparency, but also in some ways it gives people the ability to really have uh, a, a privacy layer to their life that they can control and have custody of, right? So if, you, if you're gonna use some anonymous wallets to do uh, stuff that you, you'd rather not do, maybe in the future, maybe it's your medical stuff, right? Maybe, maybe you have a separate um, blockchain kind of uh, uh, identity that does your, your medical stuff, pharmace pharmaceutical stuff, whatever. You don't want that in your public chain, right? So um, that that could be, and I that, that's a way of uh, being able to be in more control of it. One of the things that I that I think that we haven't touched on yet around data is this idea of owning your data. We're in this you know iOS fourteen point five crisis right now, uh, where people are you know marketers are are not getting the data that they feel they need in order to to you know to do their jobs, and yeah. this is all in the name of of allowing users to protect their their personal data. How yeah. does blockchain? Uh, solve or fit into this world of, of customer data? This is also one of the other areas that initially got me really excited. And maybe I'll tell it from the, I'll, I'll start from the user perspective first, and then I'll switch to the marketer hat. Um, as a user, could you imagine having like a set, like, like a, a central login where you could control every ad and every company that's allowed to talk to you or allowed to reach you across any device, any app, any experience. And also to be able to set literally your own CPM rate and to be paid directly in whatever currency, you know, they're using. Let's say it's the user side of Google AdSense, right? Or the user side of, of FBX or whatever, right? Where you're now the sell side of the equation, right? Where you're a media property now as an individual, and now you partner with websites and you're, you're an automatic partner with apps or an automatic partner with social networks, with, uh, with games, any of that stuff, right? Where if, from a user perspective, I actually don't mind seeing ads. I just wanna see ads that I, that I care about. I wanna see ads about like Porsches and you know, like, like uh, just, just, just show me what I want, right? Uh, so I don't mind that at all. And I'm happy to, to have control over it. So I think from a user perspective, the blockchain actually enables a much more uh, opt-in ecosystem, which, which is gonna be healthy. Um, from- It gives more agency to, to individuals in, in a way. Totally, and yeah. 
And, and that way, you know, like, it's not. It's like the. It's like the better version of an ad blocker, right? Where it's not like I'm not. I'm not turning things off. I'm able to turn things on, right? I, I'm able to opt in to people's advertisements and actually receive compensation for it, right? So that's going to be really cool. I think, you know, people are working on that. I'm really excited about that as a user and a marketer. On the marketing side, what's super fascinating about this is, and, you know, we're talking about iOS 14 and that kind of thing. Um, this sort of pulls the rug on these centralized storehouses of, uh, of gateway access to the internet, right? Where let's say... Uh, I, I'm on Twitter, right? The, the decentralized Twitter. And uh, let's say I'm, you know, a political figure, uh, maybe a very prominent one. And I have hundreds of millions of followers. Well, even if Twitter shuts me down, all those followers are uh, associated with my ID on the blockchain. And so now that becomes instant, instantly transferable to uh, whatever decentralized YouTube is or whatever decentralized Facebook is or whatever. So if you're built on the blockchain and you're building your audience on a, on a chain versus someone's internal database that you don't own, now all of a sudden your audiences become portable. It's, it's like, let's say, let's say your MailChimp account gets shut down. They're like, we don't like you, Chris, you have to go. Like, well, you know, that, that's kind of annoying, but okay, you know, hit the export button and then just go to active campaign, right? That's kind of what this is like now with uh, our deeper sort of social audiences and, and natural influence. I can, and I can see it. It's the same, like if you have a, a portfolio, or if you have a, a profile of what ads you're willing to, uh, you know, be monetized by or what data you're willing to, to give out, you know, you, you port that across platforms and then the, the money that would maybe go to Facebook in that instance, sorry, Facebook, if you're listening in this <laughs> case would, you know, would go to the user or there'd be more revenue split where yeah. maybe there'd be uh, some rent paid to whatever platform was being enjoyed by that avatar at that time. But the revenue split would then actually go to the user in the form of a product credit or some other kind of metaverse credit potentially down the road. Uh, yeah, very, exactly. Very interesting. So, I mean, it's, huh. it's, a bit, it's a bit hand waved right now, but, you know, there's, th this is stuff that is being developed as we speak, right? Even, even Brave browser, like their uh, BAT token and stuff, like this is being built. I think about the creator economy, right? Like the way the creator economy is totally flourishing and it's become absolutely essential in the world of D2C, mm -hmm. like all of this idea of uh, owning experiences and, and owning, owning the impact that their ads are really having and that they're in, like, it's a, it would be a way to do uh, influencer, you know, a very pretty airtight way to do influencer tracking as well. If you're able to, as an influencer, actually gain uh, stock in a company that you're, that you're promoting through this system. Well, and that's just it. And, and, and you know, it, you're right. It, it's, it, you talk about attribution, right? Now it's on the blockchain. You can see exactly where this came from or, or whatever it's, you know, where what the whole discovery chain is. Right. And so, you know, it kind of solves that issue as well. Um, the, the thing about it, though, that's so powerful. And this is this is kind of the other part of Web3 that's exciting is it tokenization turns all of your uh, audience, customers, prospects into influencers who are vested in your company, right? And so that's why you can see this like hyper success that, that's happening with some projects that take off uh, in Web3. You know, in gaming, for example, Axie Infinity uh, earlier this year was like this obscure, stupid, you know, I, I, it's not, I'm not a fan of the game, whatever. People like it, that, that's great. But um, it's like this monster fighting Pikachu game. I don't know. Anyway, it went from a total obscurity uh, and, it, and it's, it's on the blockchain. It's, it's, it's this kind of stuff to doing almost a billion dollars in network revenue a month uh, in, in July, you know, starting July, August, September, to the point where now it's waking up the giants, Ubisoft saying they're, they're getting the NFTs. EA is saying uh, decentralization is the future. Like, 
It's GameStop waiting. just announced. For the first time, I understood GameStop. I always thought GameStop was just a meme stock. It was just because gamers were investing it and they, want, they had nostalgic memories of GameStop. And yeah. then I thought like, oh, what if GameStop's going to try to not make the mistake Blockbuster did right. and and sort of actually become like, you know, this this whole experience side of gaming. Gaming is like already twice as big as movies and only getting yeah. bigger. Totally. Um, so wild. It, it's awesome. And yeah, by the way, wouldn't that be like the comeback story of the freaking century? Like GameStop rescued by Reddit, raised enough revenue to, to you know, pivot. Fantastic. Anyway, um, the point is you can see this hyper growth because there's that network effect where literally every one of your customers is now like a shareholder in some ways, right? Everyone has yeah. stock options on the success of your product, of your business. And so it's not just the influencers you work with. It's everyone becomes an influencer or a micro influencer by default, right? And that's powerful. Super powerful. Nice. Anything else? Like, is it what, just in terms of, we've, we've talked a lot, a lot of interesting ideas today, just in terms of practical takeaways for uh, D2C founders who might be listening or people maybe, well, you know, we have people that work in some of the biggest companies in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, this has me thinking about those early days of the internet when so many you know companies just had to have something. And so, so much cheesy shit got made that no one ever experienced or, and I'm sure that's going to happen in this rush as well. Yeah. But like, what are some really practical things that people can take away ab about web three? I think step one is just get your head around it. Just, just start at the basics, start at, at basic fluency. Right. What is all this stuff? What are the definitions? What, what the hell is an NFT? You know, what does it actually mean? Uh, so start there. Um, there's, you know, a16z.com and some awesome materials. They're one of the biggest uh, 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 financial partners in the space. Chris Dixon, who works there, has some fantastic content. Start there. Uh, and then the other thing is look at the brands who are getting in right now and actively experimenting with this. So uh, Hasbro and Nike and Dolce and Gabbana, uh, I think Maddle, uh, Warner Music, they're all getting in. Uh, and, you know, there's a bit of a rabbit hole to go on, uh, to go down as you start getting into it, but it's worth it. It's, it's worth getting your head around it. It's worth understanding what people are doing. Um, you know, specifically for D2C, look at platforms like Wax uh, that has an in real life, like IRL, NFT uh, uh, product uh platform where you can create digital twins of your stuff. Go look at how other brands are doing this and kind of what the use case is. Uh, I promise you, you won't regret it. Even if you have no plans to uh, integrate this stuff or whatever, just being able to understand what's actually happening and what the opportunity really is. Uh, just start there. What, what year would you say we're in right now in, in terms of like to people who contextualized their time with the internet, what year would you say we are in, in terms of web three? Yeah, great question. I, you know, I don't think we're in the Napster stage anymore. I think we, we've, we've gone beyond Napster stage. Um, to me, it's like MySpace. Uh, that's where we're at. I, I think this is kind of like, you know, in, in internet timeline, I think people are getting that this is interesting and, and they're also seeing the scale of it. Remember, MySpace by 20, 2003 was at about 100, 120 million uh, users. And it was big enough that it actually had more daily traffic than I think at the time Google did, right? And so, it, you know, light bulbs went on. It's like, okay, the social media thing is real. We can't ignore it. I think that's where we're at. I think, I think we're at, you know, okay, this web thing, this web three thing is real, you know, look at breakout successes like, like Axie Infinity. Basically why that's interesting is because as soon as you have a use case that people care about at scale, it just goes parabolic, right? And so, you know, that, yeah. that's the early indicator that we're really, really onto something. And so you can't ignore it. So I think we're, I think we're at MySpace kind of 2002, 2003 era. That's where we are. Remember Facebook. But we haven't had a killer app yet. Would you say, would you say we haven't had, are there killer apps in web three already? Is Bitcoin a killer? It's, it, I don't know if it has wide enough adoption or if it, if it's user friendly enough to be considered a killer app. Exactly. And so the, uh, I, you're right. It's clunky. It's, it's confusing. It's terrifying. It's if, you, terrifying. if you lose that thing, if you don't memorize 16 words, you're going to, you know, you're going to lose it. Oh, hackers are going to yeah. take it. Yeah. And it's like, you know, regulators are trying to figure it out. You know, every legal department, I'm sure, is just like 
shitting bricks over this stuff. It, it's like, how do you make sense of it? Uh, and so that's, that's where we're at. But the, we're seeing the early indicators, though, that the killer app is it's the overnight it's the it's the incentive structure and and the fundamental economics of people being able to own stuff and be part of something that mm -hmm. this automates that this that this puts at scale right and as soon as you do have your killer app it's game over for anything else if you can if, if you become a part owner and a direct beneficiary of your time spent online, which is probably for most of us as much or more than we spend offline, right? So this is a structural shift in how we'll be compensated and also how the value of our time will actually be valued online where we're not just donating it uh, to Facebook, Google, Amazon, whatever, right? Are you sure, like, what are the chances that Facebook's meta metaverse becomes this killer app because if it does, I was, th we were thinking about like, sure. You're, you're not going to own your data in Facebook's environment. You know yeah. what I mean? Facebook's going to have your pupil dilation. They're going to have your heart rate. They're going to have, they're going to know your response to every single stimuli in yeah. their environment, which would have Facebook marketer. That's, I don't, is that zero party data? If it's coming from a heart monitor, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but like, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm really interested. Like, if they become the killer app, that's not going to be a decentralized utopia. You're going to be able to do some pretty cool things in there, as I witnessed from his meetings and waterfalls and whatnot. Yeah, right. You know, for a 3D Facebook experience, that's great. You know, they don't... Um, web 1 is still here, right? We didn't kill Web 1 when we rolled in social networks and, and social media and whatever. Like, you know, I, my blog is web 1.0 pretty much. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I can still go to track star home star runner. I can still <laughs> someone from web fantastic. Point. Yeah. And that, yeah. You know, like, yeah. The day that comes down, we're all doomed, but, uh, yeah. so it's not about who wins. It's not the war of the world. I don't think, um, Mark Zuckerberg is going to build, um, you know, a 3d, uh, ad intelligence platform basically with, with the metaverse. And, uh, and, you know, I'm sure it'll be interesting and whatever. I don't think it's going to capture the imagination and, and I don't think it's going to capture the groundswell of people that see digital economies as their future. Uh, mm -hmm. and I think that's where web three does do that. And like, I've never, it won't seen... capture the attention that Facebook did originally you're betting. Well, it's yeah. not going to capture lightning the way it did originally with web two. I don't think so. And, and I don't think Facebook really has it in them to be honest. Um, since, since because Facebook it's not was, centralized because it's, because it's going to be centralized. Do you think that's like a defining characteristic of what becomes the killer app? Will it, will it have to be decentralized for it to be a true killer app? Do you think? Uh, yeah. In web Tough three. Questions. Well, yeah. I, I mean, as far as like, how, how can we distract people with, with cool stuff? Sure. I'm sure they can do that. But as far as what are people going to invest their time and money into, well, I think Facebook has kind of burned us one too many times with, you know, remember when we could build like uh, fan bases and then reach all of them. Remember when we, when we could reach our, our group members with, with Messenger, like they just, they just persistently pull the rug. I don't expect anything different from them this time. Um, you know, if there is any NFT inter interoperability, it'll be like their initial games that they had and then they'll, then they'll figure out how to screw that up too. I, I, just, I just don't trust them. And that's part of it is that decentralization is based on trustlessness. It's not about, do I trust this person or do I trust this management team? That's not the point. Right. And, and, and so I think it won't really factor or play a, a real role in what I consider to be the real metaverse, you know, where people are going to want to spend time, where people are going to want to spend their effort and their energy. It's going to be their things, careers. Exactly. It's going to, it's going to be in things that they can own things that they can be part of, things that they actually have a stake in. Because how many businesses have we built on the backs of these giants uh, on Google, on Facebook, uh, in a lot of ways, this this whole business, it, 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 like not e-commerce in general, but a lot a lot of what we're doing is, you know, in teaching customer acquisition, it's totally on the back of, uh, of these big giants. So this idea of something that's persistent across a digital universe is, is super interesting. Uh, totally. I want to thank you so much for coming on the D2C podcast today, Chris. If people want to learn more about this, how do they? How do you suggest they get in touch with you? Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, my main business is the Lazy Marketer. 
so that's the lazy and uh, if you want to check out that that pdf report you can you can get it for the cost of an email or just you know what maybe uh, we can just link directly to it whatever but uh, go check out the lazy see what we're doing uh, if you want to get some of my meandering thoughts on this stuff you can check out my blog at chrisrempel.com nice i bet there's a lot of brands out there that are just you know interested in this stuff and i think hopefully this is this gives us a bit of a primer gives everyone a bit of a primer on on the incredible opportunity like we're in the it's it's hard for me to conceive of the fact that we're in the middle of this like massive d to c opportunity like which is in in itself a sort of democratization of of uh, of commerce in some ways mm -hmm. lowering the barriers to entry but as we're building this there's this whole other ecosystem emerging that has you know 10x 100x kind of possibilities well and that's what's so cool about it is with with the decentralized web and because you can own part of these networks that are emerging you know could you imagine having literally shaped the original internet right and this is this is already what's happening you look at some of the first sort of nft projects that come that have come out like crypto punks or that board ape thing or whatever well these are becoming durable brands that are persisting through different mediums right and, and and you know now there's someone who's making like a comic book series and about a board ape that they have and i think they landed like movie rights like this is really, really interesting stuff that's culturally, you know, it, it has cultural staying power as the web evolves, right? And and so, you know, Twitter, for example, now you can link your NFTs and, and verifiably display things that you own through Twitter. You know, that's interesting. Reddit's doing the same thing. So, you know, again, we'll see this interoperability happen. And, and, and it, 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 for brands that are listening to this, contemplating it could you imagine playing a formative role in your space where your products or your brand or things that you've done have a durable and lasting impact where it becomes like a building block on how the whole thing runs for the next several decades i mean you, you can't even how do you even value that right so yeah it, it, it's worth looking at very cool well i hope everyone takes a look Thanks again, Chris. Have a great weekend here on the, uh, the rainy West Coast. Absolutely. You too, Eric. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can do that right now at directtoconsumer, all one word, dot co. I'm Eric Dick, and this has been the D2C Podcast. We'll see you next time.